going to be Pastor or Apostle? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Today I have my Apostle here with me and she go, I'm going to ask her some questions. But tell them a little bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I have been pastoring for going on 13 years. I pastor Life Empowerment Deliverance Ministry. And you have to know that God has called you because the walk is real, demons are real, souls are precious. And for me, being called to minister the gospel, I think it's one of the most treasured things that I've ever done in my life. I, I am a professor by trade, but a pastor for the past 13 years. And thanking God for the ability to be called, called into the, the fellowship, called to minister the undiluted, unadulterated word of God. Um, Y'all, please forgive me. I don't know what happened to me, but I got the audio. Um, Amen. That's good. But I got the audio. I'm gonna release the audio awesome. with a picture over it. The first question is, would you rather be over a small church or a mega church? Wow, that's a good one. Um, Paul had a secret. He said he's learned to be content um, in everything that he was called to do in the book of Philippians chapter 4 and about the 12th or 13th verse. So for me, it's not about the size. I, I want to really say this. I remember when God had first called me to the kingdom. And the first thing he said, don't count my sheep. I didn't understand that. Um, because I'm there washing dishes and he says, don't count my sheep. What do you mean by don't count your sheep? I'm going to tell you that every pastor that I connected and I was telling them that the Lord had called me into pastor. They kept saying, how many members? And I kept having to say, the Lord told me don't count. The Lord told me don't count. The Lord told me don't count. I'm real. I'm laid back. But for me, it doesn't matter the number. I really like the small group. Um, they have less goats in them, I believe. <laughs> and I do got a sense of humor. It's as long as God is in it. That's the most important thing. Okay, let's go to the next question. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about quitting church? Oh, yes. Tell me a pastor that never thought. Thinking it is one thing. Following through is another. Um, we understand that we're in a time where... There's so much that's happening. And a pastor can be at their place. Okay, First Kings chapter 18. Um, Elijah just calls fire down from Mark Karma. And he just busts up 850 false prophets. He gets a letter from a skeezer called Jezebel. Jezebel causes him to go into hiding. And so a lot of times for me, I remember when I was going through a dark time in my life, when I had found out that my ex had done something that he was not supposed to do. Oh, he did not call me for this. And then he says, if you think I called you because it's bed and roses, you're not fit. And so you and I have to understand that we may think it, but it's, we got to make sure that we don't follow through. Do you know how many times even Moses said, God, you know, but he kept pressing. So it's about the pressing and it's about the journey. And then I realized I had to come to the end of myself. I think every leader, whether you're on a global platform, whether you're on a, 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 a relational platform, a physical platform, a local platform, local, we, when we come to the end of ourselves, we realize that it's bigger than us. And that's what gives us the strength to press through and go forward. Okay. <laughs> when did you get saved? Wow, that's a really, really, God called me at a very young age. I want to say the age of 10. But even when you're that young, you don't know. Samuel heard, I love you, Holy Ghost. The Bible tells me in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, that after Hannah could not give birth, that she goes to church and Eli commissions and he speaks. So at the age of 10, I remember hearing the voice of the Lord. I also remember being attacked a lot spiritually. I didn't even know that I came from a lineage of women pastors. I literally found out that in my genealogy, I want to say maybe, I, literally maybe 10 years ago, I had no idea that the mantle was on me. So, but at the age of 10, I just felt, I just fell in love with the Lord. I wanted to do everything. You know, when you're young and innocent and pure, 
still got my fire. Yeah, and so at the age of 10, this is my daughter, everyone, so she knows that I'm real. So at the age of 10, I heard the voice of the Lord. And then, you know how it is in that journey, you get caught up in the world. And so your signals become skewed, fell into sin. Yeah, because, you know, at that time, they weren't really talking about holiness. Our ministry, I talk about sanctification. But what I love is the fact that he not just called me, but he qualified the call. And then the process. And we don't stop being processed until we hear well done. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've been given? Hmm. Um, by the Holy Spirit, I'm being honest. Two, two advice. Wear people like clothes. Never forget when he said that to me. I was like, what? He says, daughter, you got to be willing to take off and put on. He says, never be so fixated with the group that when they walk away, it will crush your spirit. And I never remember, and I remember when he said that and I didn't listen. He says, wear people like clothes, love people, um, pray for people. But when folk get up and change their mind and want to leave, you got to be willing to release them and love them in the fact that you're willing to release them regardless. And I think my spiritual, one of my spiritual dads I have, I call them the four horsemen. One of my spiritual dad, I remember when he had, I was saying, dad, I know I'm called. He said, he kept saying, you said the Bible says the Bible. He says, go and learn scripture. He says, go and follow what the word of God says. He says, go and study thyself approved. Second Timothy chapter two. He says, study thyself approved. A workman need not ashamed. Rightly dividing. He says, you just can't stand up and say the Bible, the Bible. He says, but you got to make sure study. And so you can exegete the scriptures and, and, and be flexible enough to move by the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of times we've become so rigid. In Christendom, we're so rigid in the church. For me, if the Lord has given me a message, and even though I sweat like bullets at times, I'm when the Holy Spirit says, shift, I'm like, Lord, help me. Because we got to be willing to shift. And that's when you know you've had a Moses encounter. When Moses in the book of um, Exodus, he goes up in Exodus 24, he goes up to get the tabernacle. Then he has to go back up again because he realizes that what he thought he needed was not. And when he went up into the mount, he did not enter the glory until the sixth day. So we got to be nimble and flexible and move by the, somebody say spirit. spirit. <laughs> we got not, not, not crazy spirit because the Holy Spirit is intelligent but moved by the spirit and, and that way we see the glory of God. So those are the two, wear people like clothes and study, study. Don't, don't, don't get people sermons and preach it. <laughs> Spend time beyond the veil, amen? Spend time beyond the veil because the scripture, it's revelation, it's, it's, it's revealed and it's alive, it, it quickens us. And so in one breath, he will tell you to go dip. And then in another breath, he will say, now I want you to pull that person up. So we got to be nimble. The word of God, Hebrews 4 and 12 is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts the soul and the spirit. It cuts the joint and the marrow. It's a discerner. So we got to be nimble enough. Because when it cuts, somebody say cuts. <laughs> it cuts. Has God ever cut you? He was like, oh, the Lord never. Yes, he has. When he pro every under shepherd. I don't, this is my belief. I believe there's only one shepherd. His name is Jesus. All of us are under shepherd. Amen. Amen. Have you ever worked with a false prophet? Mm, haven't we all? And how do you, how, wait, how can you tell like if they're a false prophet or not? Um, there are a few things. Be, be mindful when a person always wants to prophesy. And this is real. I never forget, um, and I have to eat this. Um, there was this woman of God I saw on, a well, person that I saw on Facebook, and she had a lot of likes. And I'm like, okay. And I was looking for a speaker. And I'm like, okay. And somebody, I said, well, what about this person? And this is, she looks legit. And I said, okay. Now, she had a massive following. And I'm not going to repeat her name. She had a massive following. So at the time where we were, we're in our first location, we were able to seat about 120, 125 people. And th this woman, she comes in and 
I got to be honest. First, what she was dressed like, I didn't understand. Um, I was told that when one of the leaders went to pick her up, she said, well, where is the limo? Well, honey, we weren't walking in limousine <laughs> money yet, <laughs> but the car was clean. And uh, when she came in, uh, she had on boots and I'm not knocking the dress, but you got to dress where you're going. And she gets up and I don't know what she was saying. All that stuff I heard on Facebook. I was so upset because the people were there and the Holy Spirit said to me, feed my people. I didn't bring them there for her. I brought them so you can feed God's honest truth. And so after a while, I think she ministered for about 10, 15 minutes. I'm sitting there. It's paid for. We have a flock of people that came to see her, not me because her name is major and it was the Lord says once she's done she just opened up the door for you and then I begin to move forward but I've also um, worked with people because again we have to be so discerning that's one of the things I always ask God to help me have a spirit of discerning because when you have a heart for the sheep there will always be wolves and sometimes you can, you know, Paul said, Alexander the carpenter did me much evil. He said, may the Lord repay him what he has done. So there'll be a bar Jesus. There'll be a Simon the sorcerer. And so it's about discernment. And once you, and what I love about the Lord, sometimes he'll expose immediately or sometimes he'll allow them wheat grow with the tear matthew mm -hmm. 12 matthew 13 and 25 thank you holy spirit he says while men slept an enemy came and sowed tears and so sometimes the lord will allow them to stay not to be a hindrance to you but to sharpen you and he'll say open your eyes take a look he'll say stop being dead stop being deaf listen to the hissing sound and so and it's a lot that's happening today on facebook everybody is prophesying why are we running to prophecy when we need to understand the word of God? It's important. The word that's infallible, the word that's immutable, the word. Every prophecy can make you feel good. There's sometimes God will speak to me and I'm like, Lord, was that you? He's like, yep, that was me. He says, don't think that it was the enemy because it cuts. And if you and I are going to make it into the straight gate, Matthew 7, there's a place that God is calling us. So for me, I have worked. And then I went back and I repented. I repented because I said, God, and it's not like God didn't show me. He did. But I just decided to say, Lord, well, you know, it's just my mind. And, you know. And then it was always a no, it was in your mind. <laughs> I was trying, because I'm always trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. I try never to judge. But when now your spirit, when your spirit is not settled, that's a sign. Because you talked about sign. Number two, you got to look for the plumb line. What they're saying, does it line up? Does it line up with what God is saying? You know, a lot of times people are, listen, prophecy is what's to come. And if you really want to know what's to come, it's called the B-I-V-L-E. <laughs> That's the book for, baby, open up that word, Joel chapter 2. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So you won't have to say, what? I can't believe he fell. Well, I'm not going to go to church no more. No, 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 no. This walk is individual and this walk is personal. So there has to be, you will know your spirit man is unsettled. Um, number two, their word is something that's off with it. Number three, and I think this is very important, your dreams. The Lord will begin to speak to you. And sometimes if you don't know, number four, you go into fasting. And then when the Lord begins to remove them, Ezekiel, I love you, Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter seven and eight, the Lord tells Ezekiel, take your finger and bore it. He says, see what they're doing behind the pulpit area. See the bones that they have laid up. See the filth that they are doing. See what they are honoring. And that's what's giving them their power. Their power is not from the secret place. Their power is not beyond the veil. Their power is from witches and wizards and warlocks. So, so we have to understand the number, number five, you will know because it's the word. When they preach the word, if you can't digest that thing, for me, honey, show me. We move by spirit. 
because there's going to be a connection. But show me line upon line precept. And there's some other things, but and as I've grown, I'm not, I don't believe that anyone will fully be there, but I have exercised my senses now. And I know a lot more today than I did then. And then, of course, number six, have a covering. As I cover the young people, I also have a covering that I'm able to connect with and communicate with. And if I don't understand, he breaks it down. My Bishop Okechuku Ugwe from Africa. Yes. And Daddy Rudolph. <laughs> I don't want to forget my Daddy Rudolph itself. Um, so the next question is, what do you got to say about pastors who steal money from the church? Ooh. What do the Bible say about that? Hmm. You know, the Bible talks about heralings in the pulpit. Matthew 6, Matthew 7. I don't know the key verse. When there's a heralding in the pulpit, that's a servant for pay. So because that's a servant for pay, they never came there to release the unadulterated word of God. Um, when we talk about a servant for pay, we already know that they're walking in filth. We already know that they have been contaminated and leaders, pastors have done that. There is no fear for God. I don't know about y'all, but I can't go to hell for $2,000 or $50,000. Hell is hot. When I go through, you know, thank God it's nice and fresh in here. But <laughs> I'm being honest, I do have a sense of humor, but hell is real. And so because there's no fear, what has happened? Their conscience has been seared. When you take an iron and burn it on a cloth and you remove it, there's a gaping hole there. And so because their conscience, daughter, have now been seared. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is no longer talking. The Holy Spirit is no longer speaking. And so Gehazi was one of them. Gehazi didn't know that he should have gotten the mantle from Elisha. Had he not taken what Elisha told him not to take from Naaman, he lied, lying wonders. He said, oh, my master said, take two golds and take two clothing. He says, for me and him. And so, number one, that person needs to be found out. When the Bible says a man is found out because what he is stolen, he should what? Repay. He should what? Repay. repay. I believe that that person should be, they should repay. They should be jailed. This is me. Because if you got to fleece the flock in order for you to have some kind of staying power, it's called get a J-O-B. Get a job, boo. Get a J-O-B. A man that don't work should not what? Eat. God puts item. In the garden, he said, yo, before you get queen, you got to work. You got to know how to work. You have to keep a job. Now, there are ministries that are mega ministries where pastors are fed. And I believe in that muzzle, not the ox that tread it down the corn. But if you have a small ministry, like we're a small ministry, I have a career and a J-O-B for 26 years. And so I don't got to get up there and fleece the flock. Steal from the flock. No, hell is hot. Hell is real. Amen. Amen. And he says he's coming back for a church without a spot of wrinkle. So there are so many of them. You will know. This is me. This is not for everyone. The next question is, how do you manage conflict in ministry? Mm. Mm. <laughs> you got to pray. <laughs> you do. Uh, Moses struck the rock. The people, the people, they were saying some crazy stuff. The moment they crossed the Red Sea, you look at Exodus 14, the Lord released manna. You go to Exodus 15, they go to a place where they couldn't find any water. Then the water was bitter. Ooh, you know, they were constantly fight, fighting the leadership. Number one, you never fight the head. No, you never. You may not agree with your under shepherd, but you don't fight them. You go to God in prayer. Number two, you don't correct the head. Mm -mm, that's not your place. 
Um, you don't correct someone that's higher than you. No, I believe in order. I believe in structure. No, 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 no. And so now if you know that there's an art, what you do, you first pray. Now, if you find that this thing is going on chronically, then that means you have to really pray for your leader that their eyes would be open. And then listen, you got to be willing to wait. Now as an under shepherd, now if we see, we see conflict. We, uh, for me, I deal with it head on. The moment I see it, I bring both parties in. I bring all three parties in. I don't like for you to say your story and mm -mm. let's uncover everything. Let's remove everything. Let's expose everything for what it is. And then it's important that you're able to listen with discernment, able to listen with discernment. And then you have to be able to correct, correct with the word of God, correct and not apologize and, and, and trust that what you're saying, that they will follow through. Sometimes they will follow through. Sometimes they will leave because we have a church today that does not accept criticism, that does not accept open rebuke. They are spiritually anemic. And because there's so much breastfeeding, except for sucking the multi-breasted one. And so there has to be a level of correction. So as an under shepherd, we got to be willing to correct in love and also rebuke when there is. And please, a lot of us, oh, you, you know, you, you said that so rough. You said that so harsh. Well, baby, there's sometimes Jesus spoke calm and there's sometimes... Jesus says, shut up. He'll say, sit down. He'll say, get thee behind me. He looked at Peter. Brother Peter was like, oh, yeah, Lord, I'm for you. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. If Peter was so thin-skinned, Peter would have lost his ministry. And so we got to be willing to be corrected and stay. Correct and be willing to stay. Because you don't know what God is doing for you. You understand? So conflict needs to be done. And we got to know that um, conflict, we got to make sure silence the mouth of the serpent. Silence the mouth of that tongue, that, that one that wants to gossip, that one that wants to spread flies. If you are around a person, and they're always talking about somebody, especially the head, know that that is um, what the Beelzebub's daughter or son, the Lord of the lies and Lord of the flies. Why? Because gossip, Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 17, especially going on to verse 19, it talks about six sins. Then he says the seventh is an abomination. Do you know, we talk about homosexuality all the time, but do you know that discord, discord gossip will cause a person to fall just like any other sin. So discord, that's how you handle that quickly. Nail it. Quickly, right? Quickly, right? Cut the head what? Off. Pull it up from the what? Root. Rip the what? Scales from that thing. And then build plant water. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what Bible character do you relate to the most and why? Hmm. I'm going to say two. I am definitely a Peter. I am. Wait, what part? What, Peter. what part? Like the anger part? No, Peter. No, the Lord delivered me from anger. <laughs> uh, when the Lord first called me, woo! But um, Peter, Peter was solid. When he became Peter, Jesus said, thou art Peter. And then he said, upon this rock. So for me, I would say Peter rock solid, um, even though sometimes the foundation, there's a beating, there's a pummeling, um, there's a pounding that takes place. But Peter, when Peter realized, he said, Lord, I'm not going to, you know, deny you. And then after Jesus says, yeah, after the cock crows three times, you're going to be up on out of here. <laughs> I, why why Peter because he was so real he was so trans and I think that's me I'm real as an under shepherd very transparent I say what God's word is and, and if I know I've said something out of flesh I go back and repent and if I need to connect to someone and say listen I gotta I gotta say something to you it came out wrong I'm willing to do it 
And I love Ruth. I see Ruth. Ruth came from Moab. What Ruth, what I love is that where she came from didn't define where she was going. What she was born out of was a part of the journey, which was a part of the process. She came from out of the cesspools. She came from the refuge of life. What, what she had experienced, whether it's rape, whether it's incest, uh, sacrificing of children, where we've come from. And what I love about Ruth, she was willing to hang with Naomi. Mm -hmm. Naomi was in a, in a winter season. She was in a winter place winter time and what i love about naomi uh, what i love about ruth she stayed with naomi now i am the spiritual naomi now but i relate a lot to ruth because she lost so much and and her spiritual hemorrhaging did not stop her love in christ her spiritual hemorrhaging i know the bible says in luke chapter 5 that there was a woman who hemorrhaged for 12 years but i'm talking about ruth because she had hemorrhaging also, married, and, and her husband, Milan, dies. What happens when that thing that's supposed to live dies? You keep moving forward. So she follows Naomi back to Bethlehem, Judah. She moves from a place where there's no bread. And she says, you know what? I'm going to keep going forward. And what I love about Ruth is that she was willing to work the field in the little whether there was foes of purpose or not, she was willing to work for Naomi and Naomi didn't have to give her anything. Her love was so genuine. She says, your God will be my God. She says, where you go, I'm going. She says, your people is going to be, my. she says, where you lay your head, when they go back, the Naomi has nothing. That's the person you want to know that can connect with you. That's, that's the son or that's the daughter that I would allow to be close to me. You can see me when I have little, like we are in a little state. And so because I, because you can run with me in the little, you, in the little, the flock that's small. So when I step into a stage, cause I've preached at churches that were massive, that you, I can trust you. That's the important thing. So definitely Peter, <laughs> glory. I love the fact that God redeemed Peter. Yeah. Peter preached that sermon on, um, on the Mount in Acts chapter two, he got up and he preached like never before. And what came out of his mouth was a double S sword and definitely, um, Ruth. I just love Ruth. Boaz came, glory. <laughs> Your Boaz will come. <laughs> you ready for the next question? I'm ready. What biblical period, time period, would you rather live in and why? I choose to. The dispensation of innocence, that was when they were in the garden. Um, in Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3, they were, it was called the dispensation of innocence. We're in the sixth dispensation. That's the dispensation of grace. And the seventh dispensation is the dispensation of kingdom. So you have innocence, the dispensation of law. Then you have the dispensation of promise. Ooh, glory to God. Amen. The amen. promise. So for me, I would say innocence because, you know, the word of God tells us in, I think it's Mark chapter five. He says, blessed are the pure in heart. When you really don't know, you really don't want. No. And you're innocent. And that's why the Lord said, except for you and I be as a babe, we're not going to enter. So it's the dispensation of innocence that dispensation because then after that dispensation we saw the law that had to come in because of what was violated now we're in the sixth dispensation which is grace someone say grace, grace. grace. but we do not abuse well the lord knows my heart he know i had to slip and be with tyrone last night i got up and i repented today no 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 because your life is too expensive. This thing called grace and your vessel is too expensive. Tyrone have nowhere being up in you unless he put a ring on your finger. And so even though we're in grace and God has given us grace upon grace, we have to make sure that we do not abuse it. And I, and I believe that a lot of times, and I say us, us, we have abused this thing called grace 
And God says, no, 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 no. And so grace allows us to get up and say, God, I thank you. Grace gets up and allows us to endure certain things, endure hardship like a good what? Soldier. Soldier. It's by grace that the old me would have wanted to say something, but my tongue is now under grace. It's under grace, so there's certain things I will not say. There's certain things, and I got to pull that thought down. Hello, somebody. The thought will come like a mighty Russian wind. And you got to pull that thing down and say, wait a minute. So I love the dispensation of grace. But we walk as a body of Christ into dispensation of kingdom, the seventh dispensation. And that's where we're at now. Yes, we see grace because we know that the time is winding down. And Joel says that God doesn't want none of us to repent. But the dispensation of grace is so important. But innocence, and I would say the dispensation of grace, but not to abuse it. Make sense? Not to what? Abuse. Not to what? Abuse. You know, that's when you know your mom keeps saying, "Why do you keep doing that?" And my mother was a whipper. She was a beater. She would say once, and then if it wasn't processing, my mother would just say, "Pass me." And when she said, "Pass," some big thumps coming after. Yes, that's a household. Listen, and and that's like the word when God corrects us. In the word, Paul said, who will deliver me? Romans chapter 7. He said, who will deliver me from this bondage? He said, the things that I shouldn't do, I'm doing it. So where do we draw the line when it comes to grace? How many times will we keep falling and getting back up and falling? There comes a place where you and I draw the line. So 38.10. And we say, come no further. We say, listen, I'm going to stand in this. Uh, enough is enough and then grace you'll see the beauty of grace because then he gives you the power to stand grace is what keeps so we don't fall down and get back up we don't fall down no we say god i'm gonna stand and have an altar send grace i'm gonna come alongside you and give you the strength to stand and maintain your vessel so it says in iron so there's innocence law promise and then i know the last word grace and kingdom what's in between that i don't remember oh okay. but there are there are seven Okay. Seven dispensation. All right, sorry, Seven. No problem. Innocence and then the law. You have the promise. The promise is the fourth dispensation. Okay. Yes. And then you have definitely the law, which is the fifth dispensation. Okay. Then you have, of okay. course, grace. And then you have kingdom. There are seven. I'm missing. I cannot believe this turned into something else, y'all. Mm -hmm. But um, I was <laughs> why did you start living for God? Why? Yes. You already explained that? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to hell. I'm being honest. I believe that hell is real. There's some that preach, we're in hell right now. Error, wrong, doctrines of devils. Hell is real. Number one, and, and, and very important for me, I think I put this before, number one, I love Jesus. I really love him. And I just cannot see my life without it. I can't. I can see my life without a lot of people. Yes. But when it comes to Jesus yes. Yes. and hell, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you may say, listen, hell has enlarged itself. The church should enlarge it. And the church has. The Bible says that hell has enlarged itself. And so we have to be mindful. So for me, when you're called and you realize that, okay, God has called you, he's separated you, and he has said, you belong to me, and my life is not my own. Remember that one? Yeah. I give myself. I give my. And so he said, I belong to him. You belong to him. Right. And when a person claims you, Listen, ladies, if you dating him, you date for data. But when you're in covenant, that's important. Um, your communication should lead to covenant. If he has not made it affirmative about you, if he's not made it clear that you belong to him, if you got to look for some signs and wonders, You've been there for a long, 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 long time. 
when Jesus comes to the well, John chapter 4, immediately he begins to talk to the woman. And after the while, the woman began to talk to him about other men that she had been with. And she said, whoa, this is a man right here. See, the man will call you out of what you were in. Long story short, when you talk about why Jesus, I was at a well that was dry. And then he called me and then he puts fire. So going back, if you're with in that relationship and that man has not seen, Jesus affirms you. He confirms you. Then he puts a ring on your finger. He puts a ring. He makes a commitment. That's important. Man, I was going to go elsewhere, but I said, let me stop and come back. So, um, what do you got to say about pastors who make sinners feel uncomfortable? Like they don't want to come to church. Wow. That yeah. is a deep one. Woe unto you. For you have been fallen. Romans 3 and 23 says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And where we were, are now is not where we started. And so many of us fell down and got up, fell down and got up until God gave us that power to stand and have an altar set. So to that pastor that makes sinners, the Lord always draw sinners. He it, it, is ironic that I quoted John chapter four when Jesus had to go by the well. He made sure didn't bring the disciples with him because number one they would say, "Well, why are you talking to a woman?" Because Israel, first of all, men and women they didn't talk like that, and then because of a cultural significance, Israelites, and of course at that time, so there was no there was no connection, and so we see that Jesus did not make her feel um, less than he communicated with her. So we have, the Lord is having a conversation with the sinner, but he loves her to a point where he says, now let's get deeper into your well. You got to be willing to get deeper into a person's well and be able to draw them out of that bearing place and being real and transparent. What I love when she said, Ooh, I know about the prophet and they said when he comes and, and he says, well, he is here. And so you got, we got to know as under shepherds, how to reach people right where they're at minister to them right where they're at draw because what I love is that this woman had water in her she had revival she had ministry in her and so you we got to know how to break up the follow ground the right way in God and then that what they have on the inside of them because God is doing the drawing and God is doing the breaking guess what they'll they will flock so that's how we do it we've all made that mistake we have to be careful that yes we understand that we're blades we cut, but God is never cut and he is not healed. So if we're cutting and there's no healing, we got to question that. If we're cutting and there's no remedy, we have to question that. Every time he cuts, he always brings hope. After Jesus cuts and says, okay, you've been through all those men. In that moment, she said, I'm ready. She said, come see a man that has told me all that I have. So we have to be mindful because we want the LGBTQ to come in. We don't want them to stay in their sins. We want every lie because that's who we were. We want every drug addict. We want whatever you've been called. Every Listen, the perverts can come in, but your life can't stay perverted. No, 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 no. You, we, have, we have the peeping toms who are busting hell wide open on, oh, not helping me. And so we, that, that should be in the world, but it's in the church. It's stinking in the pulpit. So now when the unsaved comes in and they discern us, because they can discern, the Bible says the children of dark have more wisdom than the children of life, that they're smarter. They can tell the fake, the false, the phony, the fat, and the fallen. Ooh, that's good. Don't ask me to repeat it. <laughs> so it's with loving kindness he has drawn us. After you draw, then the word will begin to dig. And you'll find that that person will begin to repent. You know, I'm glad you asked this question. I was, uh, we were praying for Cece. We went to see um, Cece, and her name is Cecilia. We went to see Cece a couple of days ago when I said we, myself and my sister. Now she's sitting up. She was talking exactly what God said that he would do. And I'm looking at her and then she began to say, well, she's a Catholic. No, no knocking the Catholicism, but you can't wait for a priest to deliver you. She said the priest came and she said, well, I've not confessed my sins. I'm listening there and I'm listening to her. And I said, well, beloved, you don't have to wait for a priest to come. The high priest 
has already done that. I said, you have a high priest called Jesus. She looked at me like, apostle, I don't care what you're saying. I'm looking. So that's why we have to know it's not man, that this thing is what? God itself. And all I did was begin to pray for her because Mary can't save her. Hello. The priest can't save her. The high priest. And the high priest says, come. He says, come drink from the water that never runs dry. How many more questions? I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh -oh. Um, um, I don't know if you answered this. What prayer have you been praying the longest? Wow. I love to pray. Everyone knows that we're a church of prayer more than anything. We're on the prayer line, trying to get on the prayer line. Prayer line. I know some of you all are like, Lord, again. No. <laughs> but prayer, the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer in the book of James 1, I think 5. Or James 1 and 7, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous. of For me, one of the longest prayer that I have prayed is, God, I want to walk in holiness. So Isaiah 6, when he sees that he's not where he's supposed to be. I don't want to ever think that I've arrived, that I stop praying, God, sanctify this vessel. And I'm being honest, sanctify this, cleanse me. So for me, it's about cleansing, purification. Um, not getting so deep where I'm so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good, but that's one of the key prayer. And one, another key pr prayer, it's birthed from scripture, Isaiah 49, verse 24, shall the prey be delivered from the mighty or the lawful captive. Every time I'm going through deliverance with someone, because that's the scripture that God used to deliver my life. When I was hooked to pornography at a very, very young age, I'm not afraid to tell my testimony the age of like 12, I went into my brother's room and something entered me. I felt that thing entered me, but I had no idea. I would be hooked to pornography for about 10 years in secret, going to church, loving God, but battling. And it was not until I said, God, I've had enough. And so Isaiah 49, 24, shall the prey be delivered from the mighty. God can deliver you from whatever you are in. You got to want it. The power that works in you. No man laid hands on me. When the demon left my body, I was on college campus, pregnant with my son. I was not battling out like I once was, but I, I knew that the spirit was still there. I was back. I was in it a long time and it was enough for me to suppress it, but I couldn't, I didn't want to suppress nothing no more. I wanted to be totally free and delivered. So shall the pray Isaiah 49 and 24. I eat, sleep, drink. If I'm not getting no other scriptures, I'm going to get out, shall the prey be delivered from the mighty. And that was one of the ones I taught you. Or the lawful captive deliver. Sometimes we step into things lawfully. If we run the speed sign, we did that what? Lawfully. And so as a result, we should get ticketed. Shall the prey be delivered from the mighty or the lawful captive, the things that we enter in. I went into the room at the age of 12. I'm looking at it now and I'm like, what is this VCR? And, but my brother was bound. I think I give God glory that before my brother went home, he was able to repent. I led him to the Lord. He lived in my house for about four or five months. The glory came in. My God, my God. And so shall the prey be delivered from the night. And Isaiah 49 and 25 says, yes. What I love, he says, yes. He didn't say, well, it depends on how bad. It depends on if you are tied. It depends on how much you go to church. It depends on how, uh-uh. He said, yes. Yes, the prey shall be delivered from the mighty and the lawful captive. He says, yes, from generational curses, soul ties. Yes. And so when we understand a witch and a wizard, let them cast, let them do whatever they want to do. But when God's lift up a standard, they're not going to fight you. They're going to fight the God that's on the inside of you. So he said, yes, the prey. I pray that, especially if I'm sensing something with my daughter, sensing something in the ministry. I said, God, we're captive to anything god you are the god that will release shall the prey and one more i love this one. Oh, there's so many oh i wish i could just... <laughs> isaiah no no not isaiah but psalm psalm 124 verse 7 it says our soul has escaped 
like a bird out of the snare. So if God says you and I have escaped it, we got to understand that we have what? Escaped. So our soul has escaped like a bird. And God says in this time that we are in, Jesus is the only escape route. He is the only escape mechanism. His word. So that when um, Psalms 124 verse 7. My soul has escaped. You remember what you escaped? My God. He could have exposed you and me. But he says, no, I'll give you a way of escape. The problem is when we don't continue to walk in that path of escape. Amen. He says the chain is broken. And I decree and I declare everything has been broken. As long as you want it, it can break. You have power in your mouth. Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond according to the power that works. The book of the word of God tells us in the book of Joshua chapter 10. When you read verse 24, God says, listen, Joshua. He says, these kings are coming down. Then Joshua calls his captains. He says, I want you to put your foot on the neck of the kings. The kings were in 1K, five kings that was fighting Joshua. What's fighting you? What's been king over your mind? What's been king in your spirit? God calls Joshua and then Joshua calls the captains because God says, now I want to make you a captain. You move from private. You move from private and then, of course, you move from private. Then you have corporal. But before you can even get to corporal, you have to be a private. You have to be a sergeant. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Private, you have to be a sergeant. Then you have to be... All that stuff before you can go to be a general. You know how it is. I'm 20, hmm, so you know. <laughs> so there's a rank. A private cannot become a general just like that. There is process. There is what? Process. Process. And so when you're a foot soldier, God is calling the body of Christ to be foot soldiers. Amen. We stand. That's it, huh? <laughs> oh my gosh I'm, I don't know have you ever did ministry as someone who is who is in competition with you hmm. yeah and you know you will know it but the Lord will say don't say anything it's cancerous to compete especially with someone who laid their hands on you and God spoke into their life to bring you in. It's cancerous. It's important that we remain on the low road. This you and it's so funny. Listen, people will tell, they will rat you out, <laughs> they will expose you. And the person that was in competition, they were exposed. So they thought that by because they talk too much. I talk a lot as an under shepherd, but your life have to be closed behind private doors and that's important and they didn't even know that what they thought that they were competing you, number one you can't kick against the prick it doesn't matter how great you think you are someone is always greater it doesn't matter how wonderful you think you can preach please there's some little children i'll have to sit myself down the thing is humility and so no 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 we don't compete against churches we don't compete again the body is jointly fit Everyone, Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, everyone is needed in the body. Everyone is jointly fit and called. So if you are called to be the hand, don't try to do what the foot is doing. You're called to be the eye. Why are you trying to do what the ear is doing? And, and as a result, we, we see that there's this division, this faction. And so this person thought that, you know, I, I can do that and, She's not the only one. Well, bless the Lord. Once I found out, I forgave them because I brought it to their attention because they got exposed. And then I was honest. When they tried to come back, the Holy Spirit said, no. Sometimes the Lord will say, separate. Don't even allow them back in. And then sometimes the Lord would say, allow them back in, but let them go do their first works. In other words, don't have them serve. Don't have them do nothing. All they can do is come, bless the Lord, and you keep going. 
because your spirit born Jesus Simon the sorcerer had looked at the prophecies and he says give me this thing I want to pay for it and and Peter looked at him he says be gone with you he says you thought the gift of God could be purchased with filthy lucre and so this person that was in competition you're not in competition with me none of us because the ministry doesn't belong to you boo the ministry belongs to Jehovah you and I are only stewards so there's no pastor that has a church the pastor the under shepherd is called to be a steward when you look at Genesis when when God put Adam in the garden he was a steward over God's stuff and when we are understanding that we are stewards over his stuff let him be responsible for it so he plucks out he pulls down then he builds and he plants we just want to make sure that we're good stewards and we're faithful stewards over what he has called us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you want me to keep going or stop? Whatever it is that you want to say. <laughs> she says you're watching it in love. Because <laughs> you love what she's doing. <laughs> What's your favorite Bible verse? Oh, Lord, I thought I already established that. Isaiah 49, um, 24 to 25. Also, I love Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should like. That means he's immutable. He's unchanging. So Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not a man that he should like, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have you not spoken it over your life? He says, I'm about to make it good. He says everything. So he's immutable. He doesn't change because we fell off, because we stopped. He's, he's there right there saying, come on. Come on, I still believe in you. Come on. He calls back. He says, come on. He says, listen to the shepherd's voice. Come on. Because a sheep, you know, sheep needs to hear the voice. Sheep yes. needs to be yes. led properly. Yes. Sheep. Yes. So he's right there saying, come on. He has a rod and a staff. Yes. Glory. One yes. to beat, one to correct. One to pull and one to beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He has that yeah. one. He has that one to bring us in the rod of correction. Yes. And the staff, amen. We only want to be cuddled. He says, if you're willing and obedient, we got to be what? Willing and obedient. Isaiah 1 and 18, we'll eat the good of the land. And so we have to understand what he's saying. So there's so many scriptures, John 3, 16. So what's your favorite scripture? Oh, I have, I have quite a few myself. Give I me that, one. Definitely, <laughs> though, I do love the one that you said that God is not a man that he should yes, lie. Yes, Lord. Um, I also, um, I believe it's in Ephesians where it says it's by grace and mercy that we are yes, not consumed. not because of our own self. Yeah. That it's by his grace and mercy that we're not consumed. Yeah. Yes, it's I not by that. us because. Yes. Lest any man should boast. Yeah. None of us have any reason to boast. Paul said, if I should boast, he said, if anybody should boast, it should be me. He says, born Hebrew of the Hebrew. He said, baptized, circumcised. Yeah. And he says, all of that I realized, he said, accounted loss. That yeah. I may win Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So that's definitely one of my favorites. And there's a bunch more. But there's I'm not so gonna... many. We can't yeah, even. We don't even have enough no. time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy because I haven't even read the full Bible. So I'm just like, mm -hmm. wow. I don't know. Yes. God just leaves me in awe. That's yes, fine. Yes, he does. All righty. This next one says, oh, what do you enjoy about being a pastor? Oh, I think one of the things I enjoy being a pastor is being able to touch the sheep, being able to connect with them. I'm one of those pastors that you can touch. I'm not one of those pastors that, you know, put the rod between me and the sheep <laughs> <laughs> and say, you there, but I, I will bring the sheep in, love on the sheep, hug on the sheep, correct the sheep, Pick the stuff off of the sheep because someone had to do that to me. Someone had to see me when I was dirty and clean me up and, you know, pick the ticks off. <laughs> but I believe that there's so many of us pastors, we've become such idols. We're, 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 some of us think that we're bigger than God. Yeah. You got a big old church, which is awesome. I'm not mocking that because I believe that God will grow and increase life empowerment. But even though, then you got to make sure put the right leaders over. Because there comes a time where you look at, for example, I don't know, T.D. Jakes or uh, regardless of what they're saying, uh, Tony Evans, regardless of what's going on, because we see what's taking place. You got to know you have to put the right person over them. And I believe that if the, the under shepherd 
does not remain touchable, remain transparent, we lose something. Uh, we, and then, of course, you got to be mindful how transparent you are because you have some people, they're just, their pastors are so perfect. <laughs> their under shepherds are perfect. And then when they hear something, oh, no, devil is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> So, but we pray, we got to pray that leaders will be so transparent behind the closed doors that what we see is what we get. Yeah. That we will live a life. And so behind closed doors, I can't be disconnected and then hallelujah, glory to God. And I don't respond to a message. Now, when you grow in numbers, I know that changes because you put key people over a set. The Bible tells us that when Moses was doing it all wrong, his father-in-law Jethro came and says, listen, you're going to wear yourself out. He says, I want you to anoint and raise up leaders and set some over thousands, set some over 10,000, thousands, 500. He says, set some over he says, and you handle the most important stuff. But, but that connection, I believe that that's the most, because I believe every shepherd smells like the sheep. That's the reason why Judas had to kiss Jesus. He looked like the sheep. He smelled like the sheep. And they could not identify our king until Judas kissed him. Mm -hmm. That was the sign that this is the one because he looked so much like my sheep. And there's a commonality, amen, that we look like him, the image of him. And we are made in the image and the likeness of him. So I think being able to touch, that's important. You know, um, just a quick backtrack, because mm -hmm. you just said that story about, I actually want to change my answer. Um, my top favorite verse that I've ever read because mm -hmm. of how much it broke me wow. was when he said, do what you came to do, friend. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. right. After that kiss, how would like, you do quickly? I mm. I remember when God brought me to that verse after I had broken a covenant that mm. I did with. I don't have a reason to lie to y'all. I'm, yeah. I'm living by grace. That's why that's my second favorite one. You know what I'm saying? But I remember I broke a cup, a very serious covenant with God, and He brought me to that verse. And I just remember how I fell to the floor crying because yes. I was like, "That's what it is." Mm -hmm. Every time, Jesus said, "Do it quick." <laughs> quick because he says you don't know what's getting ready to come to you yeah amen that's yeah. why you don't touch an under shepherd david knew that mm -hmm. that is Saul was you know you have a pastor they're not doing right god knows how to pull one up and tear one down yeah. and god will then tell you well apostle then should i continue to stay there no then you pray to the lord and if he gives you the release to go you still go to them that's honor to say this is what's sensing and I want to do it right in you. But you have nowadays, sheep migrate. They leave. <laughs> <laughs> they just get fat. up and leave. <laughs> oh my gosh, help us, Lord. Yes. <laughs> All right. And then this is the last one. Drum roll, please. <laughs> All righty. So. This is going to be good. Describe yourself in three words. Isn't that something? Wow. Three Woo! questions for three words. That's a good one. Faithful. Loyal. And aggressive. <laughs> Faithful to the call. Loyal to the flock. And I am aggressive. I will go after the wolf. I will go after the bear in prayer. <laughs> uh, I will go after David in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He comes on the scene and when he begins to give his dossier, he says the bear and the lion came in and I went after. I am aggressive. I'm an alpha queen that God has called me. And I thank God because I remember when the Lord had come and said, are you sure? He says, Lord, I know you'll be faithful over the few because if you can be faithful over the few i can have you rule loyal you won't trade this thing you're loyal and i am i'm loyal i'm loyal and sometimes that can be a fault of mine 
And sometimes the Lord is trying to say, let it go. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. <laughs> but I'm like, God, can't you? And sometimes he'll say yes, and sometimes he'll say no. This is the year of replacement in life empowerment. I remember the Lord, I said that he said, I'm replacing. And I thank God for what he's replaced. And aggressive, I, by, for me, it's by any means necessary. And I know, of course, Malcolm L said that. And the backdrop, and for me, by any means necessary, by any means to get the body of Christ, to get that soul saved. But if it means to tell my testimony, if it means to say, this was where I was when I was about your age, and look what God has done now, aggressively preaching hell, sin, damnation, iniquity, because those things... Are, are like, you know, roadblock to a lot of the saints' ears. We only want stuff that makes us feel good. But no, in the midst of the good stuff, the makes of we got to also talk about the other aspects so we don't miss God. So that aggressive, being aggressive about my faith and knowing who I am and not trying to be someone else. No, Amen. because I've not worn what they've worn. That's why I love when David said, I've not proven this. If it says, no, I can't flow like this. I have a big old mouth. <laughs> I do. Some pastors are soft and sweet. That's them. This one <laughs> is loud. You hear me coming. When I came into the earth and I cried, it was announced to the heavenlies, this one is light. She's come to do my will. Hebrews chapter 10 says, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It's written of me, oh God, to do your will. So faithful loyal and definitely aggressive amen mm -hmm. let the church say amen come on daughter <laughs> close this out close us out we were recording right we didn't know all of that and it was not recorded right? recording? i know we we did record no no i know <laughs> really <laughs> no. let me pray <laughs> the stratosphere, troposphere, mesosphere, ionic sphere, galaxy, baby. Amen. And may what you do touch the seven continents. Yes. May it bleed through all the continents that God has called you to do. And God has called you to be a beacon, especially in this day and age. We'll be so young. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. For your glory, we thank you for your presence. God, we're just so excited about just this moment. This moment that will never come back again. This moment that's defining. This moment that is called to lift. This moment that's called to declare your glory. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Isaiah 61. For he's anointed me to preach the gospel. Send me to bind up the brokenhearted and to declare liberty to those who are captive. The declare the opening of the doors to them which are bound. This is the acceptable year. So God, I thank you for what your daughter is doing. Yes. I thank you, God, that she'll continue to go from glory to glory. I thank you, God, for other pastors, other leaders, other reachers that will come and answer real questions about what's taking place in ministry, what's going on in the kingdom. And I declare that the best, the best, the best, the best yes. is still yet to come. Amen. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We gotta, we gotta stop. We got, hey!